Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Hi, everybody. I'm Nancy. I'm from CAFRA, and I thank you for joining us today for this version of TAB Sunday Sessions. Joining me is Mr. Martin Cullop. Hi, Martin. Hi, Nancy. <laughs> so, as some of you are probably aware, we're doing this as a special session because of what's going on in Australia. So, I'm going to, um, I don't know if you remember, but maybe this didn't happen to you, but Remember when you went into class and the projector was sitting in the middle of the room and you were like, yes, because you knew it was going to be an easy day and you were going to be watching movies. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with a segment that was um, produced and edited this afternoon, well, this weekend. And you can see just like a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about. So without any further ado, and hopefully I don't screw this up, we're going to try to do this. So let's see. Australian government will ban recreational use of e-cigarettes. Federal government will ban recreational vaping. Australia, which already has some of the strictest smoking regulations in the world, has just banned vaping for recreational use. It's utter devastation. Um, the Australian vape industry and the vape community as such uh, received a nuclear bomb today. Craig Jackman's Theverton vape store is about to become collateral damage. Totally cut of my head. <laughs> collateral damage in a war on vaping by the Australian government and the TGA. Yes, the TGA is the fuckwits that brought in the prescription system a little over 12 months ago and like pretty much everyone in the industry told them this was a terrible idea and is gonna result in a black market, and it has. What's not in dispute is this booming market has been pushed underground. It's a de facto prohibition. Every month, millions of illicit, unregulated vapes are imported into Australia. <laughs> The Australian government seems to believe that history never repeats. The prohibition of alcohol a century ago was a failure. Prohibition fueled a massive black market with soaring crime rates, gang violence intensifying, and yet alcohol was still widely available. Cheap disposable vapes are pouring in from factories in China sold here by local dealers to convenience stores and tobacconists as part of the illicit trade. You've got disposables that have exploded over the last 12 months uh, in Australia being sold by fucking Uber drivers and corner stores and not vape companies at all. They're being sold on the black market by fucking just people. And uh, yeah, of course, the youth have taken them up and uh, yeah, the Therapeutic Goods Administration are freaking out because their stupid, ridiculous prescription model has blown up in their face. Big Tobacco has taken another addictive product, wrapped it in shiny packaging, added sweet flavours to create a new generation of nicotine addicts. Hold on a second. Current legal vapour products available in Australia are not big tobacco products. What is available are products developed and sold by SMEs, independent vape companies with no ties to big tobacco. People like to go on about the um, problems of vaping faces as attributed to big tobacco. It's not. Big pharmaceutical is behind all of this. And if you follow the money, it's fucking pretty obvious what's going on here. Big tobacco's in the thick of it. The tobacco industry lobbies and they lobby hard. You have to be willing to, uh, to stare them down. To stare them down and look inside their wallet. Whilst accusing the independent vapor industry and harm reduction advocates of being paid by big tobacco. Meanwhile, both major parties have been accepting political donations from Big Tobacco for years. How are you comfortable then with accepting donations from Big Tobacco because the National Party does? They do, uh, they do. And so you said, you, you said your father's experience 
You talked about people going into hospital well, sadly, with these illnesses. Cigarette smoking so is a, you... well, it's a, it's a legal entity in Australia, and uh, you know we but, won't but, even but, start but where Labor's say, accepting their donations. But you can say from. no to donations because we are talking to you about about then, people getting addicted to nicotine. Um, you can say no to those donations. It's a it's a legal product, smoking, and uh, whilst it's a legal product. Uh, you know, we won't even start but, where but, Labor's but getting not, their donations but you're not happy, from. But you're not happy accepting those donations from... Well, I'm not happy with the number of young people vaping. I'm not happy with the, the million or more Australians vaping. But it's a, it's a fact. We must, we must address it. Australia is set to ban all single-use disposable vapes in the nation's biggest anti-smoking crackdown in a decade. Well, the cost of a packet of cigarettes will rise by $10 and vapes will only be sold in pharmacies as part of a government crackdown. Today I announced that tax on tobacco will be increased by 5% per year over the next three years starting on September 1st because we know that a higher priced cigarette is a more unattractive cigarette. Their uh, idea is that a more expensive cigarette is a less attractive cigarette, which we all know is rubbish because since the government started heavily taxing cigarettes, smoking rates have kind of plateaued, they have stayed the same. The same people that are smoking are the same people paying more for their cigarettes, contributing over $14 billion in the last financial year to the government's coffers. Just remember that figure, $14 billion is what the government gets from cigarettes. So they're leaving cigarettes alone. They're taxing them a little bit more, but you won't be able to get your vapes at a vape shop. You'll still be able to get your smokes at any fucking service station or supermarket or corner store. Well, smokers who want to switch from deadly cigarettes to much safer vaping have to jump through hoops to, to do that. But if they want to keep using deadly cigarettes, uh, they can get them very easily from 20,000 outlets. That's crazy. Over summer, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, the TGA, consulted health groups and our community, and they provided us with a clear roadmap. The first thing to do is to stop the import of vapes that are not destined for pharmacy shelves to be sold as a therapeutic product with the approval of a health professional. Do you really think that prohibiting flavors, prohibiting vape stores, prohib prohibiting the import of big hardware devices that are expensive, that are costly, that are bulky and that appeal to adults is going to wipe away the black market? What is your assessment of the reforms that were announced this time yesterday by the health minister? Do they make sense to you? Yeah, I was very excited to hear that the health minister is going to make decisive and bold action on vaping reforms, particularly that the importation of all vaping products, regardless of whether they contain nicotine or not, will be prohibited unless those products are bound for a pharmacy. This is going to turn off that tap of illicit products that have been flooding the market in Australia. I am really proud of the changes that Mark Butler announced today in relation to vaping. Absolutely support this. This is a great initiative. We know that a new young generation of Australians are being hooked on vapes and this is a fantastic initiative. So the AMA have been calling for it. We're delighted it's going to happen. Whilst the Australians pat themselves on the back and celebrate their win, will this have knock-on effects across the ditch in New Zealand and beyond? Australia has just announced a major crackdown on vaping, effectively banning the recreational use of e-cigarettes. The only way you'll legally be able to get your hands on one is in a pharmacy with a prescription. And it's sparked calls for changes to happen here. We have got our vaping settings all wrong and we are going to regret it big time. You know, I'm up for even looking at bans. 20% of our youth who are regular vapors is terrible and we need to address it now. Hold up, Letitia. The study you reference was a casual study with no basis in science. According to the ASH New Zealand Year 10 study, experimentation is common, but daily vaping is just 4 to 5% of 14 and 15 year olds in 2022. Australia's had prescription only for a number of years now, yet they're at 14% youth vaping, so it's not necessarily stop young people accessing vapes, and the vapes they're accessing in Australia are illegal. You need a prescription for the nicotine vapes, no prescription for cigarettes. Why? 
Well, because cigarettes have very deep roots in the community. They've been around for decades, and I think tobacco they're worse control... For worse for your health. Oh, they're, they're, they are terrible for your health. They remain a major killer of Australians and people across the world. But I think tobacco control experts recognise that they do have deep roots in the community, and it requires quite a different, more sophisticated suite of measures to drive down tobacco use. Because there'd be too much of a black market for cigarettes, is that the problem? Well, but also because there are deeply ingrained habits that some people have had for many decades. You are committing the greatest crime in Australian medical health history by increasing, by, by fanning the flames, by, by fertilizing the black market. You're going to see it extend beyond belief. You can guarantee that with this new change, you're going to see even more black market sales of uh, vapor products because this import scheme is not going to work. It didn't work with the prescription only system. It's certainly not going to work now. It seems that the Australians are trying to regain their glory days of being the leaders in tobacco control and will sacrifice their own citizens in their quest to be at the top of the heap. Only problem being is that this policy is going to cause more harm than good. Hi, Martin. Where do we start? You're muted. There we go. <laughs> I must do. <laughs> well, I, 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 I love, I love uh, 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 Butler's calling the plan sophisticated. I thought that was really quite funny. <laughs> well, I mean, here's the thing. You're in the UK, right? And I'm in New Zealand. And, you know, we've got regulated consumer market. We're seeing our smoking rage drop. We're not seeing any massive, you know, quote unquote, youth epidemic. Even putting the youth epidemic aside for a minute, okay? Basically, it's a big F you to, to adults who want to access harm reduction. So it, it's anathema to us because it makes absolutely no sense. But I want to know because the UK is the leader in this. They are the global leader. And, you know, talk to me. What are your take? What is your take on this entire situation in Australia? Well, I, I, it's, it, I, I find it quite... You know, I try not to laugh about these things. I, I know, I know, I feel for Australians really deeply. But, but when you're from the UK, you look at what's going on over there, and it's just hilarious. I mean, it's just it doesn't none of it makes sense. Just in that video you showed there, you've got Becky Freeman saying big tobacco's all over it, um, and but they're giving money to the parties, but the parties aren't really listening to them, obviously, are they? Because because the, it's not getting them anywhere. Um, you know, part, apparently big tobacco is all over trying to legalise vapes, and yet here they are um, double banning vapes and banning recreational vaping. Uh, and and I love the bit about the treasure. The, the, is it the treasurer uh, or the head of the treasury in in um, Australia saying, "Yeah, oh, the yes, head of treasury." Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. We're really pleased that you're banning disposable vape or banning recreational vaping. Of course he is, because he's getting another three point three billion billion dollars into his into his coffers of course it's good enough i mean that should surely set red flags flying all over the place in government um i i, I don't know i mean i know it's not good to sort of talk about talking about people you you meant to be uh, a bit more sophisticated than that but mark butler i i i don't know what what he, he i don't know what he's doing i mean he he seems to be incredibly naive very gullible it's quite clear he's been uh informed by all the wrong people but surely as a politician he should be able to sit down you know late at night when you, things are a bit more lucid and you're relaxed having a, a glass of scotch or something and think this just doesn't make sense why are we doing this why am i having to go on that shows like that seven is it seven thirty, and having to actually defend a prescription model for a, a product which which he knows is vastly safer than smoking and then he knows he's going to get asked a question. Well, why are you not adding prescription to to cigarettes? And he's having to come up with an answer for that. Well, they're deeply embedded in into our society. Um, but that's okay, then, is it? You know, I'm not one for. Sorry, my cat. <laughs> she loves these things. Um, I'm not one for wanting to ban, uh, you know, cigarettes or 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 put swinging taxes on them or anything. I'm I'm not in favour of that at all. But surely a politician should see 
how ridiculous that position is where you, where you are saying that the only vapes that are in pharmaceutical packaging and and becky freeman saying we're going to stop them all at the border unless they're heading through a pharmacy and and yet you can buy as alex Wodek said you can buy cigarettes in twenty thousand locations across the country i mean i just don't understand how a politician can do that and think he's gonna look good on tv when he says it but i think i suppose that in general you've got such a hysteria in, in Australia because of the poor advice this guy's getting. He, he, I mean, doesn't he not look around the world and think, why is no one else doing what we're doing? You know, does he not think we're a bit of an outlier here? Maybe we should get, you know, maybe we should stop listening to those guys and get a bit more of an independent second opinion. But he's not doing that. He seems to think he's doing exactly the right thing. And yet he's being asked all kinds of questions and nothing triggers in his head to think this is all a bit bizarre. Mm. It's, it's you know so I'm sorry I I honestly do feel so so um, in sympathy with people in Australia but from the UK you just look at it and and it's hard not to laugh it really is and uh, you know it's, it just seems such a uh, the politics of it is just like watching a clown show to be honest yeah Richard um, Prune hi Rich um, he said you know how can you how can the police how can you police the border when so much contraband makes it through already I mean the border is obviously porous as hell anyway um, but getting back to the whole idea of big tobacco right big tobacco is so entrenched right tobacco is so entrenched in in the country you know this it, it strikes me and I'm, I'm trying to be civil and polite here but this strikes me as a, as a massive cover your ass and protect your assets kind of thing okay because of the amount of money that they are getting from tobacco excise, okay? But what what kind of tweaks me um, the most about all of this is that, you know, these are, they're sitting there at a q and A. I I mean, when you watch that section from the Q&A, and they're talking to the guy from the National Party, and they're like, well, you accept donation, blah, 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 blah. And everybody starts clapping. And I'm just sitting there going, hold on a minute. This thing was broadcast on national TV in Australia. Did it not click to anybody to see that what was happening here? And that's the thing that, that just like, you know, we, we, we saw that segment in New Zealand. Somebody shared the link and we were all just like, what the hell, right? Hmm. What is it? I mean, going back to what you and I had discussed like two months ago about what the World Health Organization is planning on implementing and how they're planning on interpreting 1D and harm reduction. My first thought when this came down was, okay, Australia is the poster child for what they want to do. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think they are because I think they're seeing there are other countries um, which, which ban things. And this could have been the UK, by the way. I have to stress this. You know, you've got Brazil and Argentina, for example. I think they both banned vaping outright instantly the moment they came on the market, about 2011. But you've got to think that the UK was set to ban vaping in 2010. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it was it was only um, vapors, and you know it was getting involved and, and replying to the consultation, which which the medicines, medicines healthcare and regulatory authority, which MHRA, which now regulates vaping quite liberally. But in 2010, they wanted ban vaping within 21 days, and quite a few countries did that. But I'm I'm hearing that some of these countries think, well, hey, maybe we were a bit bit you know a bit too quick to do that, and they're sort of thinking. You know, we're in a bit of a situation here. We've got this big black market. People are vaping anyway. The genie's out the bottle. You can't put it back in. What we're going to do to make this a, a, a coherent policy? And yet Australia is coming up with this completely incoherent policy. And 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 I think Simon Chapman said something. Oh, there'll be countries queuing up to follow our our lead. I don't think so, Simon. I mean, really don't because this this is just <laughs> such such a bizarre policy we've, we've 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 made it prescription only it's caused a huge black market so what we're going to do we're going to have them in plain packs and we're going to say they're only allowed to be sold in pharmacies and um, and we're going to do all that banning thing and the, the black market's going <laughs> we ain't doing that <laughs> we're quite happy just selling illegal products like we've been doing since you had your first policy and they're going to carry on doing that and how a politician can't work this out we've got a huge black market because of our policy let's double down on the policy so ego. listen to the wrong people and no one it's is going ego to martin it's ego okay yeah. I'm, I'm sorry i interrupted you but you know the no, first no, ego sorry. in bright neon letters right 
I mean, this whole um, focus on, you know, we're going to be global leaders. It's, you know, there was a time you and I will remember this. Some people watching may remember this. There was a time when, you know, Australia was the global leader in tobacco control. And, you know, they fell off that perch and they fell hard. And I think that this is about them, you know, cozying up to the WHO, FCTC, and trying to regain that lost glory. Um, so, you know, when, when you're operating from a place of pride and ego, you don't actually see everything. You only see what's going to get you where you want to be. And I think that's what's happening. The problem, of course, as we all know, is that it's going to cause a lot of harm. And that's the thing that scares me. I mean, aside from the fact that I've been deflecting effluent over here on the New Zealand side, interestingly enough, none of it really is making the mainstream media, even though they're calling me and interviewing me, right? Is, you know, everybody's jumping on the bandwagon. And this is the thing about politics. And you and I have had this discussion before, and I'd like to know what the, what the viewers think of this. Politicians seem to be reactive. They're looking for their next um, photo op, right? Um, it's optics. And it's no, re it's really no different than the media as well, because, you know, it used to be back in the day, you know, in the previous millennium with, when, when Martin and I were actually in primary school, that, you know, your broadcasters and your news people would tell you the information so that you could form your own opinion. And now we've gotten to the point where, They'll tell you what they want you to know, and they'll tell it to you in such a way that they get clicks. Um, so it all becomes a popularity contest. And somewhere along the way, truth is just gone flying out the window. And I'm not sure how we can correct that. I mean, the only thing I can think of is we need to speak up. And, and, and I mean, not just, you know, blathering on on Twitter. OK, I mean, people really need to get out there. They need to send letters, actual letters. They need to send emails. They need to go visit um, an MP's or, or a congressman's, you know, office. Okay. Because one of the things that, that's lacking in all of this is the human factor. Now, Martin, I know you have ideas on that. So please share. Well, yeah, I, I agree with you. It, politics, um, you know, I'm old enough to know when when political parties had sort of like uh, set goals and they had priorities that they, you know, Labour in the UK tended to look after the working man and the Conservatives wanted a low, low tax, uh, uh, small state government uh, and didn't like the nanny state. We've now got this blurring of boundaries where you have the Conservative Party in the UK is, is passing all sorts of nanny state laws and you've got Labour in the UK saying you're not going hard enough. On those poor people you know and so it seems to be they're just scratching around trying to find policies that people will vote for them with and, and a perfect example I, I mentioned to you in an email was in australia you have the labor party um is is banning recreational vaping and considering most smokers come from poorer populations they're they're cutting off that escape route for people who would normally vote for them and you have the National Party saying, no, this can't work. It's creating black market. We're going to, we, if we get elected, we will bring in a regulated market. And yet across the ditch in New Zealand, you have um, the Labour Party uh, having a regulated market quite sensibly. And you have the National Party saying, no, we want to do the same as the Labour Party has done in Australia. So there's no, there's no consistent approach to this or any other matter. It's, it, you could take any other policy area of this. It's just what they think is a policy that people will vote for them for. So they're scratching around trying to find something, flying flags here and there, seeing if it works, watching the polls, see if it's something that would work for them. So the only way we can stop them doing that is by writing to these people and saying, we don't like that policy and we don't think you should do it. And if you do do it, we're not going to vote for you. That, you know, it's fine going on on uh, Twitter and social media, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, and, and going on about how this is wrong and that's wrong. But those things are up there and they disappear in a second. Exactly what you said, you need to get into the real world, get into, into, the, into, the, into the debate with these people. Because at the end of the day, they are, they are um, that they answer to the population. And if the population is sending them letters and saying that we don't want you to do this, they have to take into account. Um, and I've been trying to get people to to write to um, 
to their elected people about uh, COP10. And, and unfortunately, we haven't had too many campaigns going. But I know there's a lot of people who are interested in that. I know people are aware of the issues with COP10. Um, we, you have to say as well that Australia is very deeply involved with WHO, not just trying to flatter them possibly with this policy, but one of the six members of the FCTC Bureau, which will be writing the agenda for COP10, is from Australia. So they, uh, we all, I also have to add, I'm sorry, yeah, there's a lot about that. Okay, it's fine. Yeah. Go I on. also have to add that the, 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 um, the, the uh, scientific report, which, uh, which they send out to the parties to guide them when it comes to these meetings, the latest, latest one was uh, Tom Rig 8. It's called Tom Rig, Tom, Rig, Tom Rig 8. And that's already talking about banning open systems, talking about banning flavours. You know, but the next one is due out at the end of June, Tom Rig 9. And who's to know if they might include in Tom Rig 9 a policy uh, suggestion like what we've just seen in Australia? So this could then feed into COP10. So we have to we have to get our voices known about all this, and not just you know write to people in Australia. If you're Australian, write to your your politicians and say this is a ridiculous policy. But at the same time, um, these are all going to feed in what the EU is doing at the moment. It's going to feed into COP10. It's a big big meeting, and that's where we need to sway. And there is there's going to be battles at that meeting, and we want the good guys to win out. But the more good guys there are the better so uh, really consumers just just write to people you know make your views known it doesn't take long to send a letter or an email and and just do that does that make sense yeah, yeah. it makes total sense i mean and and you know it, it a couple of people from australia have, have contacted us over in new zealand and said well help us and i'm like well i can't do it for you See, that's the thing. None of us, we're all here willing to help you and to support you in whatever you're doing, but you, it has to come from Australia. It has to be initiated and led by Australian vapors because they're not going to listen to anything that anybody outside of the country, I mean, God, they're barely listening to you guys, right? Yeah. So, you know, the more somebody tries to shut you down, the louder you have to get. And if you do that, um, you know, then you might see some change, but it's the, I, I keep coming back to this. Okay. It's the humanizing thing. Get out there, get off Twitter, get out there, write a letter, go to the MP's office, go to a town hall meeting. If they're, you know, having some kind of meeting about something else, you know, that it's health related, get out there. Okay. I mean, yeah, it requires effort and it requires initiative and some people don't have the means and I get that you can still write a letter. But, you know, we have to move this whole thing off of, you know, online and bring it back to a human thing. And that's a very, for me, that's a very big point of this. Um, I may be wrong. I don't know. What do you think, Morton? Yeah, it, it is true. I, 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 I always talk about an MP. He, he was only briefly an MP, but he, he was elected as an independent in the UK in a London borough, a guy called... George Galloway. He was a quite colourful character. Some people might have heard of him. Um, but he, he once said that if he had five letters on one subject in a week, they, they would hold a meeting about it because it was something that obviously people felt felt strongly about and they would multiply the, you know, they think, well, five people have, have actually written about this. Um, they're just the people who've written to them. How many others are thinking the same thing in our constituency? Mm -hmm. So they, they would have to sort of consider what their reaction to it would be. Um, and, and this is the thing, going back to the point we said before, all politicians these days are interested in who's going to vote for them. So if they're not getting letters, they'll think, well, everyone's probably quite happy with what we're doing then. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I think this is probably the root of some of some of the ridiculous nanny states. I mean, just in Australia, for example, just on the face of it, they're, they're banning disposable vapes on, on assumed harms. Well, they could be harmful. We think they may be harmful, so therefore we've got to ban them. I mean, do you remember... Years ago, politicians used to use that as a last resort. We will only ban something if it's the last resort because we, we don't want to interfere in people's lives. We don't want to tell them what to do. We want them to have a decent life. We want to just guide them in, into the way, you know, give them information, let them make their own choices. Now we're getting to the point, ridiculous point, where in Australia they're banning products, which they know are massively safer than smoking. They know this. But they're, they're doing it because they think this is a popular policy. But we have to say to them, it's not a popular policy. 
Um, it, it, they, they, you know, there's been a mass hysteria and there's lots of people screaming about our oh, youth vaping and everything, which, as Clive Bates said recently in a, a thing with Brent Stafford, well, if you take all the things that, that youth could be at threat with, it's a very minor concern. But in Australia, yeah. it's been ramped up into this massive, um, horrible threat. And, and and that's the reason these politicians are doing it, because they think it's popular and they'll get votes from it. So we have to get out there and say it's it's not the right thing. And make yourself, like you said, you know, present yourself to these people. You're not just a, st a statistic. You're not just a number on a page. You're not just a thing to be manipulated by government policy. You're actually a human being who it will be affected by this. I mean, I that video you showed, the, the poor guy with the vape shop who was in almost in tears, that should trigger something in a politician. Uh, but if, if he doesn't get in touch with the politician, if he doesn't sit in front of him, the politician won't know it. He'll just see, you know, he's just a figure on a page. And we have to get out and actually sort of make our voices known. And at the end of the day, I always say this, consumers and, and the public are the most powerful voice. We are more yeah. powerful than the lobbyists. We're more powerful than Simon Chapman and Becky Freeman and all those types. We have more power, in our opinions, than they've got because they can't ignore voters yeah i mean and that's the thing i mean bernie was saying here you know he's like how can we sue australia if they don't do as they're told not that you can sue them use your vote that's what you have a vote for use your vote okay use that channel that when somebody is elected that they are they, they work for you you know and i think a lot of people and not just australia but i think there are a lot of people globally that they don't um activate their civil civil rights in that aspect of, hey, wait a minute, you work for me. Um, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with questioning authority, because I mean, in some cultures, and this is, you know, very relevant in some of the LMICs, is that you don't question the government. And, you know, because you risk of whatever's going to happen to you. But, you know, there's a way you go about doing it, too. Um, and you do have a certain rights that you are allowed to activate. It's not so much that you can't, it's how you do it. And that's the effectiveness. And that's kind of coming back to what we're saying and what Richard agrees with you on is that, you know, humanizing it, you know, an, an official letter so that it's tracked um, face to face, things like that. Um, Australia is a huge country though. Let's be honest. It is a ginormous country. So it has to happen everywhere. It just can't happen in Sydney or in Melbourne or in Perth. It's got to be everywhere. I'm, I'm personally not seeing it. I mean, but I'm not in Australia, um, but it's frustrating to me because, you know, it's one of those things where I look at it and it's like almost as if Australia tries to emulate what goes on in the United States as well. And when Australia emulates what goes on in the United States, you know, Australia farts and we smell it here in New Zealand. OK, <laughs> and Australia is very important. You know, there are many times I've spoken to officials and public health people in Asia, like in Malaysia or Thailand or in the Philippines, okay, for example, Indonesia as well. You know, a lot of their public health people were trained in Australia, okay? That was the closest, you know, Western place for them to go get trained. So whatever Australia says, they think, oh, uh, you know, but no. And what we're finding is that the, the, the advocates that are in those countries where their public health people were trained in Australia, they're getting out there and they're engaging with them and they're giving them the information that they're not getting from FCTC. They're giving them the, the stories and the testimonials. And so far, we see what's happening. OK, it's not rocket science, per se, but it does require a certain amount of effort and a little bit of coordination. Um, but it, again, it has to come from Australia. Um, politics, you know, I, I'm not usually a political animal. I don't know, Martin, are you a political animal? Because I'm usually not a political animal. I've, I've always been interested in, in politics. I, I used to live in a pub years ago, and um, and probably the reason I, I'm sort of quite invested in nanny state stuff is that that I, I was always watching the budget when I was a teenager in early 20s and working in the pub and all the people in the pub were interested in how much has the a pint of beer gone up by and how much has a packet of fags gone up by. They weren't interested in the GDP or yeah. or tax thresholds or anything like that. And I'd try and explain all the rest of it to them. But all they ever wanted to hear was that because they were just working class guys, uh, you know, roofers and, and road workers and things. And all they cared about was the nanny state stuff. So I suppose I sort of took a lot of, of that into it. So I've always been interested in politics and how it works. Um, but just on the Australia thing, again, one other thing that you'll you'll find 
you know, with Mark Butler and his complete lack of concern about vapors, is because he probably doesn't hear from them. And, and his advisors, we know all, we know who the, who the advisors are. It's Simon Chamber, it's Becky Freeman, it's Emily Banks. I, These I, are the people yeah. are, uh, who are, are, are advising him. Um, they're just saying, you know this from when you see things on Twitter from these people. Um, they just talk about how uh, all vapors, that they're all from front groups. They're just paid by. That's what he, that's what they're whispering in Mark Butler's ear. Oh, don't listen to all those those vapors. They're they're all being paid by big tobacco. You know, they're just par parroting big tobacco's lies. Um, so it's only if they receive a letter from these vapors, it's if if they receive letters from them with their story and say, I'm this person. You know, I'm I'm a shop worker. I I whatever you do, and and I I vape, I smoke for 25 years, and now I quit, and I use like raspberry lemon or something. That's mm. the only way you're going to get through that advice, and then hopefully the politi politicians will go back and say, Simon Chapman, I'm getting these letters from people, and they don't seem to be like um, paid by big tobacco to me. They seem genuine people. That's the way you get the human element in. Exactly what you said, Nancy. Yeah. I mean, just... but the, the other okay. Carry on. No, no, I'm just saying that's exactly what we do. And 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 uh, the database, I think you set up that database, didn't you? All the stories. Uh, mm -hmm. Those stories are very powerful. I know Clyde Bates thinks a lot of those stories and said these these are very compelling stories. And we need to be writing to our politicians and saying, this is my story. This is this is why this is important to me. Yeah. You know, I'm doing this because I care about it. No one's paying me to do this. I'm doing this in my spare time because it's something I really care about. And then when he does get those, that bad advice, he's then got some questions to fire back at people like Simon Chapman saying, hold on. Um, what you're telling me isn't what I'm experiencing with the letters that we're getting. So, and that's the thing. We, we, have to, we have to instill that seed of truth or doubt, depending on which way you look at it, um, into these people's minds. Because, you know, Brian King said something a couple months ago, which just like totally twisted my knickers, right? He was like, oh, you know, all these advocates, you know, they're dropkicks sitting in their mother's basement, right? Now, here's the thing. And I posted this on Twitter, too, and a couple people left. I'm like, you know, the last time I was in my mother's basement was Christmas 1994. My son karate kicked the cranberry sauce across the Irish linen tablecloth. And guess who was downstairs in the basement trying to get the stain out, right? Mm -hmm. That was the last time I was in my mother's basement. Um, but the point of this is that, you know, for them to say something like that, that, you know, is very telling because that means they see us as a lower form to them. They have absolutely no conception of the fact that, they're, that, that the, 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 a lot of us, okay, they're doctors, there's lawyers, there's businessmen, there's entrepreneurs, okay, yes, you know, and, and housewives, which is just as equal, and a blue collar guy, which is just as equal. The point is, okay, they have this idea, this perception in their head of who we are, and it, they don't know who we are. And I think that the reason they don't want to know who we are is that will just completely blow that idea right out of their minds. And that's one of the things that we need to do is we need to make it very clear to them. We're not lazy. We're not dumb. And we do care. Okay. Because the behavior that's coming from the other side is, is, is strange as this may sound, it's predatory. They're taking advantage of the situation. They're taking advantage of people being fried because of COVID. They're taking advantage of the COVID thing and, and the, the economic hits that everybody took. Well, what's the easiest way we can make money? Oh, let's do this. Okay. They're not thinking about their constituents and they're not thinking about public health. They're thinking about dollar signs or pesos or, you know, bot or whatever it is. Okay. They're not thinking about you because you're not in their face. And that is just beyond what their mandate is. Their mandate is they're elected by you to represent you in your interests. And this goes all the way up to the United Nations. Okay. There's a reason it's there. It's there for you. But if you don't exercise your right to it, then they're going to continue to do these things. I mean, and that's kind of the way I'm looking at it. I'm like, I will yell and scream till I'm blue in the face. I'll do it in a nice way and I'll be polite and I won't swear, at least not publicly. But, you know, everybody else needs to do that too. And I understand that some people might not have the confidence or the, uh, or, or the ability to actually do it face to face, but everybody has the ability to reach out and write a letter. I'm sorry. You know, I just, and I get so frustrated because what happens in one country is going to impact another country. And I mean, don't you care about your own people? 
Don't you care about your fellow man? Obviously not. We've hit this stage in life where it's something out of, you know, an Orwell novel. How did this happen? Well, why are we allowing it? Well, what do we do to, to subvert that? And that's just me. Yeah, I've, um, I've, got, I've got a number of things to say about that. I hope, hopefully you'll indulge me. Um, uh, firstly, one thing I've found uh, about, about the authorities or the, the public health guys in Australia, I think some of some of their stubbornness over this is a personal thing. I think they made, they sort of like jumped on the side of the fence of not liking e-cigarettes early on and they got attacked on social media, quite rightly, don't get me wrong. Um, and now I think they're just digging their heels in and I think it's a personal thing with some of them. They just don't like vapors and now i think part of it is personal they just want to rub our noses in the dirt and and i think they they know i think they know deep down that they're wrong and they're doing something wrong but they're not getting any pushback particularly and and the organizations they can throw things around and say that they're funded by industry or whatever um, and maybe they're not getting enough input like i said it, it just bypass them they, you don't need to write to them but write to the politicians secondly you said about um the thing that brian king said uh, a UK um, a UK journalist, broadcast journalist, Andrew Marr, said something similar about 10 years ago about blogs. Uh, he was basically, because he's a journalist, he was saying, well, you know, we, 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 us journalists, we've got standards, we have, we go through qualifications and, and we, we have, um, you know, we have a regulator. But all these blog bloggers, they're just, they're just people wearing pyjamas and, and in their mum's bedroom and, uh, and just having their opinion. Right. But then since then, what's happened is, is you see some of the most prominent bloggers from 10, 15 years ago. Some of them are in Parliament now. Um, some of them are working at, at, at organisations like um, the Daily Mail, the Daily Telegraph. They've been taken on because they were they were excellent writers. And what we now see is because they were pro producing instant news, whereas the newspapers weren't, they, they were behind all the bloggers. Now we see newspapers trawling social media to try and find what these old bloggers are saying because they get to the stories before they do. And in the UK, the b biggest political blog, Guido Fawkes, has got a, a bigger circulation than every newspaper apart from the Daily Mail. So, you know, they, they, the whole thing changed, but there, there was still that professional disdain for, for just civilians getting involved in something that was seen as a professional thing. And I think we see that with the public health uh, lobbyists, uh, activists in, in Australia because they just don't want vapors influencing their decisions. They've made their decision and they don't want to change it. And I think it's got a bit personal with them now. Um, but it, why, what, citizen, citizen act, activism, activism with, the, with the internet and emails and, and everything, we can do that now. And I think we should be doing it. And, and if it disturbs them, then so be it. But we, but we have to do something. And, and it's... It, it's, it's everyone can do it and I'll also mention that it, um, you said you know if you're not confident about writing you don't have to write brilliantly to have this just talking locally just up the road from me there was a an old manor house which has now been turned into a supermarket um, and uh, it's, it's literally walking distance from where I am and I remember they did a consultation just with the local council and and I wrote this really you know well-written thing sort of with my opinion and then i went onto the website where they published them all and there were people just putting one liners one or two liners but everyone's it didn't matter some of them they had misspellings they had there there and there you know <laughs> put in the wrong wrong places and everything but it didn't matter they all were taken into account when it came to the planning decision for this supermarket in this manor house and they did have some success because it there was some there was some roofing uh, which was quite old which had to be kept there were certain aspects of of the land use that had to be kept and and the council listened to them it didn't matter that they didn't write like a, a pulitzer prize winner or a booker prize novelist you just have to make your view known and you get your point across in any way you can so i don't think it has to be well written particularly you just have to make your voice heard well i mean it, you know it, it's elitism I'm going to go off on another tangent. Sorry, guys. It's elitism. Okay. It's our way of the highway. George Bush, remember, well, you know, whether it's or against us. Um, and, and the sad part about that, about all of that, okay, is that it's, it's, it's so intrinsic and entrenched in all levels of society. It's that, it's that, you know, we've got two levels here, you know, the elites and then the rest of us. 
And, you know, it, it, it reminds me of um, lunchtime in intermediate school, right? You know, the cool kids table, okay? And, you know, how did we get here? Because I remember that, like you were saying, you know, it, it, your voice mattered, you know, your, you know, even if it was just you, you broken English, let's just say, okay, it mattered, but now it doesn't. Now it's like, now we can ignore them. We're just not going to pay attention to that. And it's gotten to the point where, okay, here's a sign. Oh, we're not going to, we're going to denigrate that because it doesn't follow our, our MO, right? Our modus operandi. But here's the problem. And this is something I brought up on Twitter. I did it. I did it. I brought it up on Twitter when Amatoa posted something. And I said, you know, this is the problem here, okay, is that these people who are supposed to be our experts, okay, are, are spouting stuff that isn't actually objective, or nor does it follow the scientific method, okay? So who do we trust? Mm -hmm. It's gotten to the point where people just are so complacent or apathetic because of this, because of COVID and whatever else is going on in their lives and the impacts of that, that, you know, these, these, this cabal, let's just say, this cabal of predatory elites has has this has the stage. They have the microphone, okay? And they're saying what they're saying. And people are just like, yeah, okay, whatever, because they'll believe it because they're so fried from what we've all just gone through in the past three years. Okay, I get that. I mean, you know, I can understand something and without condoning the, the behavior, okay? I can understand why people are just like, oh, screw this. Hmm. But this is why we have what we have. And it's almost like, you know, one bad apple in a barrel, right? If one apple's rotten, the rest of them are all going to go bad. So we've got to deal to the rotten apple so that the rest of it doesn't go bad. And that is not just our job, but it's also the job of the people that are involved in that field. Okay. So if you're working in scientific research and you see that some of your colleagues are doing this kind of stuff, you need to call them out. Okay. If you are a politician and you know, Fiona comes to mind. I think of Fiona Patton so much. I wish we could have cloned her and just filled the Australian Parliament with people <laughs> like Fiona Patton, right? Um, you know, everybody has a responsibility to maintain the integrity of their professional expertise. Mm. When did that go out the window? I must have missed that memo somewhere, you know? Um, and then this whole thing with the children. OK. And, you know, we're talking about children. Of course, you're going to talk about kids because kids elicit a visceral, emotive response. I mean, it is like the best PR campaign. Whoever came up with it, you know, brilliant. OK. But what about the adults? Because here's the thing. We talk about the children. Right. And we've seen the stats and we know that there is not an epidemic and there never was an epidemic, just like there wasn't an Ivali epidemic. OK. Um, when we think about children. What we should be thinking about are the adults around them, because that is the primary influence on them and the impacts of what they do on their lives. OK, I was lucky. I grew up in an extended family. I had my grandparents and my great aunts and uncles. And, you know, nowadays, a lot of kids don't have that. And some of it, especially in in lower socioeconomic straight up people, you know, the, the people that have no money. A lot of that is because they lose their elders from disease and death, bad habits and bad nutrition, okay? Why aren't you focusing on that? Meanwhile, you leave the thing that will most definitely will kill you with a 50% guarantee, you know, it's going to kill you. We're going to leave that on the market. And we're not going to worry about the kids that are smoking. We're not even going to trace the kids that are smoking. We're going to worry about this because it's a threat. It's an existential threat to them. It's a threat to their funding. It's a threat to their tax base. It's a threat to their authority. That's what this is about. Okay. And I will bring that up with anybody that, you know, I'm, I'll talk to anybody about it and I'll explain it to them and I'll do it in a very civilized way and make them, but you got to make it relatable so people can understand what it is that you're saying. Yelling, screaming, ranting, cursing, whatever, you know, I mean, I love vaping Bogan. He's insane. Okay. But he swears far too much, but I get that's who he is. Okay. And that's his way of articulating it. But these are the things that these people need to hear from the average person in their own voice even if it's broken English, even if it's written in, in totally screwed up grammatical English or whatever language, that's what we're talking about. I mean, would you agree with that, Martin? Yeah, I mean, the, the youth thing, not just in, in this this area, but every everything, all the nanny state promoters yeah. uh, always talk about children. It's just it's just um, the easiest way to get, get in the ear of people, you know, pearl clutches and 
whatever that character was in the simpsons you know when somebody think of the children but but i i always find this is a this is a, a bit of a, a desperate thing that they that they use i mean you know if if there was something more solid they would use they would use it but the only thing they've got that clive's a much better speaker than me clive bates but again in that that um spot that he did with brent stafford recently he said you know the the people who are most at risk here are people who are over the age of 35 who smoke mm -hmm. because as he says the science says if if you smoke when you're young if you quit before the before you're 35 years old your mortality um risk goes back to being the same as a non-smoker so the the youth aren't the ones that are a threat here really in fact you know you could say because youth smoking rates are going down so much you know vaping is actually helping them it's it's, it's you know because they're not going to die from vaping but like you said one in two of them can die of smoking if they carry on with that as a habit but but it's the older people that are most at risk and, and somehow our policymakers have, have seemed to have forgotten that they, they've been misdirected and they've been directed towards this youth vaping thing rather than thinking about where the harm actually is situated and it's situated in older people who have been smoking for 10 15 20 years and uh, and they've tried patches and gum they've tried hypnotherapy they've tried cold turkey they've tried everything else and it didn't work but vaping did or or heated tobacco did or snus did or or nicotine pouches did that's where the, the that's where the big benefits to public health are going to be coming from um, and I think, again, I think the, the people who are opposed to harm reduction, um, I don't think I don't think they don't know that. I think they are quite aware of that. But as you said, a lot of it is funding. You know, they need the harm of smoking. Otherwise, some of them will be made redundant very, very quickly. So it's a, it's, it's a big sort of like um, political dance going on. And there's money in it and, and there's there's pride in it and there's hubris and and there's and and sometimes people like chapman for example he made his decision early i think sometimes in his quiet moments he probably thinks i wish i had been on the side of harm reduction because i think secretly he knows that he made the wrong decision but he's he's made a decision and he's too proud to sort of turn around and say you know what i think i was wrong with this one i i, I don't know it, it maybe it's in the character of these people who are just like bossing people around they just can't back down but he would get much more credit, someone like him, if he did put his hands up and said, you know what, I got this wrong and I'm big enough and I'm brave enough and I'm man enough to admit I got it wrong. But it's not just him. All over the world, there are people like that who I think, looking at it, think we can't ban these things. It's impossible. The genie's out of the bottle. We should be doing something right. But at the end of the day, we want to keep that funding going for a bit longer until we retire. And, and all I worry about is if the young researchers come through and do the same thing. But I think we'll see more enlightened views of these things. And, um, and I'll always say this, we will eventually win, but we'll only eventually win if we all speak up now when the threats are quite prevalent. Because because if you just let them get away with it, and this goes for COP10 as well. You know, Remember, if, if we don't get the delegations going and saying the right thing at COP10, um, it goes through on consensus. If everyone sits on their hands and doesn't say anything, then these things will pass by default. And we will have a ban on open systems and we mm. will have a ban on flavors we will have a ban on nicotine salts we have nicotine flux which makes all vaping products the same we'll have all of these things we will have them if people don't speak up for them and the only way we can get the delegation to speak up for them is by bombarding them with letters and making them make their decisions i'll say another thing i'm sorry i, I talk about a lot about cop 10 but but the delegations have to be uh, announced to the fct secretariat uh, by july so we're only now two months away from when those delegations will have been chosen, approved and vetted by their organisation. Uh, they will be announced to the FCTC. And when they are, because they're solidified, those, those delegations will be going there with their country policy red lines and, and uh, recommendations already embedded. So this is why we need to speak to the delegation or the people who organize the dele delegations in each country we have to speak to them now before they've made their decisions so that they they go to the, the, the meeting fully informed of what we would like them to do and and fully informed of how important uh, vaping products and safer nicotine products are 
for people in their country. If we don't do that and they turn up and just sit there and just nod their head and wave everything through, that's when we're going to get the bad things. And one last thing, which might be a bit scary, I've spoken to someone who's a, a very big expert in COP things, and they've said the best we can hope for, I think they're wrong, I hope they're wrong, the best we can hope for is if we get away with just all flavours being recommended to be banned all over the world. So if that doesn't make you want to send a letter to your uh, national or your elected MP and to your focal point person in your country, then nothing will. He says that's the best we can hope for. Now, what's the worst going to be? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's... <sighs> Worst case scenario is they pass this whole thing that they're planning on doing in Australia is actually an example of what they want everybody to do. Okay. This is it. I mean, people, what you're, what you're seeing in Australia is what they want. Pull up. That's it. If you don't want that, then you need to speak up. And if you're in Australia and you don't want this to become the norm, then you need to speak up. Um, cop 10 is so important. Yeah, Rock. Hi, how are you? Um, Blinky, we're all angry. Trust me. Um, you know, because this one is the one where they're going to talk about all the things that were postponed because of COVID. And again, bring, and I hate keep bringing up COVID, but I have to, okay. A lot of these people are operating from trying to mitigate and overcome the economic problems from COVID and they will do whatever they possibly can to do that. And they will look for the easy way. And they see this as the easy way. And that's as scary as that is. That's what it is. Now, um, I did ask people for questions. I don't see any there. Um, but yeah, Blinky, you just came in. Um, basically, we'll watch the replay. But basically, what we're asking is that everyone, especially in Australia, okay, You've got to contact your local MP. You've got to have that face-to-face -face with them or a letter, an email if you can't get out of the house or you can't write a proper letter. But, you know, it needs to be humanized. It needs to be personal. The more people do that, the more it, lay, it lays the question in the head of these MPs when they're presented with these things, okay? Uh, I know that Australia is difficult because it's a federal system, so you've got the local and the federal, but both. You need to get a hold of both, just like they do in the United States. Um it's not going to be easy. Nobody said it was going to be easy, but then again, anything that's worthwhile never is easy. Okay. Um, the problem with, um, in summary, the problem with the Australia policy is that they're doubling down on a bad policy. They tried to, to ban, they tried to medicalize and created a black market. This will only pretty much explode the black market. They cannot control that border. They think they can, um, but I think, you know, maybe that maybe that's not the ultimate goal. I think this is about optics. I think this is about blowing their own horn. I think this is about ego. And look, look at us. Look what we're doing. OK, they want to be the global leader again. And I think it's something my mother used to say to me. You know, pride goeth before a fall or hoist by your own petard. Right. Um, this could blow up in their faces. And, and the saddest part of this is that the people who are going to pay the price for it are going to be the consumers in Australia and the people who smoke in Australia. And that's a fail. That's a massive fail. But the they're not going to want to see that. And the, and the, and the, and the, the, the uh, decent vape businesses as well, who are basically being closed down. Yeah, the, I mean. Black market won't care. Black mm. market won't care. This is great. This is great for us. Because yeah, but here's the thing. If it, all, all the legal market will be, as, as um, Becky Freeman said, anything that's coming in this country has to go to a pharmacy. It's got to be in plain packaging and everything else. Black market's going to be saying that's fantastic because we're going to be the only ones providing things that people want to buy. Thanks to the government. Thank you very much. Jeff, thank you. Perfect. Everybody read that. Yeah. Here's the thing with the media. I'm just going to say it, okay, is contact them. Um, if you've got a broadcasting standards authority in your country, they, put, they, they, they broadcast something that is an outright lie, complain. Okay, this is something that you have to, I mean, we do it all the time. The thing in New Zealand, though, of course, is they're, they're cheeky and they rebroadcast something from overseas, like from Australia. And because they didn't create the content, they can get away with it. Just keep that in mind. But yes, contact your Australian media outlets, um, even if it's a local paper. Okay, even if it's a local rag, go in there and say, hey, can we talk? I want to talk to you about something. Okay, 
It's getting it out of the echo chamber. It's getting it away. It's getting it out beyond us because we know what we know. But they're trying to prevent us from being able to get that out because they want to control the narrative. That's what this is. Okay. Um, hold on a second. Martin, there's a question for you. Uh -oh. <laughs> Can you explain to Janine about layman turns, what COP10 is? Oh, crikey. Great. Well, COP10 is... is um is a it's conference of the parties um is what cop stands for and the parties are national governments and what it is it's it's every two years they have a meeting to talk about um uh, the fctc the Fr uh, framework convention on tobacco control which is which is a, an international treaty which has been signed and ratified by 182 countries uh there were 193 who are allowed to turn up to uh cop 10 because there are five countries that haven't ratified it but they have signed it and they're all allowed to have an input but but these are your representatives and they'll be going along and what these meetings do is they look at the treaty and think what can we what can be added to the guidelines of the treaty uh which they they then decide on and then that feeds back to all those 180 or 193 well 182 countries could that ratified it sorry and if for example they were to decide in november that they would like to recommend that all of those 182 countries ban ban open systems, which is one of the things they want to do, then all those 182 countries are obliged, because this treaty is legally binding on them, to ban open systems. If the COP10 meeting decides that they want to ban all flavours, uh, uh, all flavours except tobacco and menthol, even all flavours uh, except tobacco, then all of those 182 countries that turned up who have signed and ratified the treaty are obliged to put that into national laws. Uh, so, you know, it's very, very important. And and they, all the other threats they've, they've got, um, you know, the nicotine flux, I think, is the most damaging one because um, it would it basically say that the only legal products would be ones that emit a certain, a maximum amount of um, nicotine, not so this is why they don't like open systems because you can change the wattage and you can put different strength liquids in. They're not going to, they don't want to regulate on that basis. They want to regulate. You can have as, as strong a nicotine as you like, and you can have whatever device you like, but at the end of the day, it's only allowed to emit this much nicotine. And, and that nicotine flux, which they call it is, is the measure of nicotine emissions over time. So it could say you can only be allowed, say, four milligrams in an hour or something. So imagine you've got a vape system, which you, which, is, which you can buy, where you've puffed on it three times and you're really enjoying it. And then it switches off for 20 minutes and you're not allowed to use it again until, the, until, the, until that nicotine flux level has got back to normal. That's the kind of thing that they're looking at. And this is all documented in the COP, COP reports that the FCT Secretary and the, um, and the TOBREG scientific evaluation committee which is all very very they use very uh, cherry picked evidence for this these are the things they'll be talking about and they've had five years since the last meeting in person in 2018 in geneva to get all of this evidence together that they've got so far that's all we've seen so far we haven't seen the agenda yet that won't be coming out until september we don't know what's going to be on the agenda because the last two fctc bureau meetings haven't released the minutes haven't published minutes so we don't know what they're talking about but they will be talking about what's on the agenda. Um, and, and, and they've got another scientific evaluation report coming out at the end of June, which could be even worse than what we've already seen. And it could include, like we were saying, what Australia has been doing, because Australia is one of the six representatives on the FCTC Bureau, which writes the agenda. So this is a really, really big deal. And we need to be getting involved in it. And the only way you can get involved in it, you can't write to the WHO, you can't write to the FCT Secretariat, you can't write to the Bureau. You can write to your elected MP or your representative in your own country and say, we want you to go to this meeting and stand up for my interests. And you can write to what's called the focal point in each country, which is the link between the FCTC Bureau, which writes the agenda, and the individual country, because the, the Bureau talks to regional it's complicated, talks to a regional um, regional coordinators who then feed the information back down to the focal point and each country's got a focal point. So that's who you should be writing to, the focal point. You, you can find them um, 
I think Nancy, you've you've done a, a file of all the focal points in all the countries, haven't you? An Excel file. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where the hell is that? All right. Janine is asking you another question. I'm going to see if I can find that without actually losing this entire live stream. So while, you do, while you do that, if you look for that. I, I just want to give a, a a shout out for Mark Mark Seidler's comment because it made me smile. Too many things in Australia want to kill you: bugs, spiders, snakes, and now the government. I thought that was absolutely inspired. <laughs> <laughs> what about Janine's question? Uh, I communicate with the Federal Director of Tobacco and Bacon. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, anyone, anyone who who is in in the government. I mean, in the UK, I I, I wrote to my MP, who then wrote to uh, Department of Health, and okay, we've got a good country over here. But they came back and they said, as a world leader. In tobacco control, the UK delegation to the 10th Conference of Parties will clearly set out the government's approach to reducing smoking, including the contribution of e-cigarettes and other safer nicotine services, to support the government's ambition for England to be smoke-free by 2030. Uh, we will share the UK's experience and the lessons learned in our approach to voting. So they've said that they're, they're going to go to the conference and they're going to stand up for the UK's policies, but they're not going to go and save the world. They're going to go and say, "Look, this is what we do." Um, they're not going to go and call out all the all the BS that's coming out from the FCTC sector or anything else. They're not going to rubbish the Todd Reg report, but they're going to act in the UK's interest. But we need more countries. I'm, I'm sure if there are other countries go there with the same intention, they'll sort of get together because they do tend to when they get to these meetings, they they form into groups. So you'll have. I went to one in India in 2016. And I was hearing what was what was going on inside. And you had groups with like Thailand and Brazil and Argentina and, and all these horrible Mexico all saying we want this proposal. And then you had other groups um, who were sort of fighting against them. And these were all having meetings and they were sort of battling out between them between themselves. If the UK just turn up to COP10 and said, no, we, we don't agree with any of that. They can say no, but it's only going to go so far because they work in consensus. They're not on votes. And if, if the UK is the only voice and there's 181 other countries saying, no, get lost, they'll probably back down. I mean, that's just the way it works. You need a coalition and you need a number of countries to talk to each other to be, and you know, hopefully powerful countries with a few other ones coming on behind. The UK, fortunately, has got the Commonwealth, so it'd be nice if we dragged some of those countries along with us. Um, Canada's in the Commonwealth. It'd be nice if Canada joined in with us. That's quite an important country, I think. And I think Health Canada's um, talking some good talk at the moment, Janine. So if you've got got some contacts in there, you could you could sort of uh, try and speak to them and say, you know, what are you going to do for COP10? Are you going to make some good messages? Go along with the UK. Maybe New Zealand will be a, a country who might go along to COP10 with some good messages. Philippines. Um, you know, you hear about Thailand and Malaysia are thinking about regulating. Uh, I've heard some good, good reports from a couple of Latin American countries that they're thinking about about this as well. It'd be nice if the USA stands up for its own policy, which officially the FDA's policy is that vaping products are far safer than smoking and should be encouraged, even though their regulation is all over the place. The official stance of the US um, is that vaping products are far less harmful than smoking and can make a, a difference to public health. So it'd be nice if the US continued to go along there. Um, one qualification with the US, they haven't ratified the treaty, but they have signed it and they're very powerful, even though they haven't ratified it. They, they do have a voice and they're allowed to speak. So this is what we need to do is just get delegations to go along and stand up against all this horrible stuff coming from the WHO. And so that, that we don't end up with a ban on vaping uh, open tank systems and ban on flavors, nicotine flux regulation, and 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 did I mention redefining smoke? <laughs> no, you <laughs> didn't. You might want to get into that. Which, yeah, redefining smoke. They want to redefine smoke. Um, they say that smoke should be classified as any visible aerosol which comes from a thermal uh, a thermal reaction. So anything that's heated that creates something you can see. Uh, an aerosol you can see they're gonna they want to define a smoke and there's a very simple reason why they want to do that is because the fctc the original treaty which was written in 2003 
and, and ratified in 2005 was before vaping products really existed. And, and they have to abide by that because all these countries have signed it. They can't reword it. Um, and, that, and the original wording was to protect against tobacco and tobacco smoke. And so they, it, to, to get all these things through, they want to redefine vapor and heated tobacco aerosols as smoke so that then they can, they can implement plain packaging, public smoking bans, no, no vaping in uh, public vaping bans, no vaping in cars with children, plain packaging, high taxation, all the rest of it, all the things that you've got with smoking already. They want to redefine smoke to include vaping aerosol as well. And these are all these are all in their own documents. They, you know, when I first read the redefined smoke one, I personally laughed out loud. But but the more I see it, the more I think, well, no, they're serious about this. This is what they want to do, and they have to do that to get it into the treaty. So this is a big meeting, and and everyone should be getting very active. And and again, I always say it's consumers have got the strongest voice here. We're the ones we write to our our elected representatives write to our focal point person say you have to go to this meeting and you have to stand up for me you know it's funded by me it's going to affect me um, this is what i'd like you to do then just yeah. just do your bit really. do what you're supposed to do which is basically you're supposed to be representing me not oh. your own agenda right um Jeff brought up the GSTHR from 2023, but I can't find it online. I linked the 2021 in chat. Um, Martin, is there an online copy of the FCTC explainer that you did? Of the actual treaty? Of the explainer that you did. You know, that thing that you wrote, uh, explaining everything that's going to happen. Um, I've, I've, is it, I've, is it I've, online? I've, I've I've sent loads of things out. Um, the NNA, the, NNA's, <laughs> the NNA's got the NNA UK has got. Um, I've I've been sending things all over. The NNA UK has got um, a good um, file on all the threats, with references right, hold on. with references to um, to the COP documents and and the top right. report where you can find them. That's, right, that's I'm going to that. And I think the the, the uh, Sovape and there was four French organisations basically did the same thing, and and Carmine in in Italy and PVU they they translated it into Italian and did the same thing. It could be as simple okay. as that. Acer in Thailand, I think, published the press release recently uh, with yeah. the letter to the focal point in Thailand, didn't he? Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, he did. Yeah, um, it's interesting to me. I mean, you know, we're kind of going over time, but that's all right. It's interesting to me that it's all the countries that are the LMICs, right? The ones with the bans are the ones that are actually sitting here talking about actually regulating, and then the ones that had some kind of regulation or no regulation are pushing towards bans. And yet, the focus for according to what we've seen from the people that are funded by Bloomberg, um. Okay, Jeff just said in Spanish, the threats are in a Vaping Today article. Jeff, get me um, the link, please, and I'll share it. And yet the LMIC seem to be the ones that are actually getting ahead, and the West is kind of going the opposite way. And I find that interesting, and I'm not sure quite how to process that yet. But, um, you know, the countries, it's interesting. The West looks back down on the LMICs in the East as like, oh, they're all corrupt, and they're banana republics, and this and that, and all this negative crap, Right. But yet they seem to be the ones that are finally, oh, wait a minute, hold on a second. And I mean, I'm not saying it's altruistic. A lot of these countries, it does come back to, oh, we can, re we can recoup some cash, you know, exactly. taxing these things, right? Um, but, you know, it, it just, you got to sit there and think, and go, wow, you know, how yeah. far are they going to go? How greedy are they going to be? And yeah. obviously, they're going to take it as far as they possibly can. Yeah, yeah. You know? Um, but yeah, Jeff, um, what we'll do, guys, just so you know, there is a chat on WhatsApp if you have WhatsApp. Um, it's a global chat where everybody gets together and talks. If you want to be part of that, what you've got to do, <laughs> because I mean, that's going to be chaos in there, but that's all right. Um, send me an email. Um, I'm writing it in here, and I need your name and your phone number including your country code. 
then I can add, then I'll add you. I'm typing, I'm saying what I'm typing because, you know, it's early in the morning. Uh, <laughs> um, because Global Chat, just so you know, um, there is a group, it's on WhatsApp and advocates from all around the world. And we all go in there and we share information. Sometimes we're bitching, sometimes we're asking for help. Sometimes we're just commiserating, okay? There's a lot of information that goes into that group. And there's a lot of um, also support. You know, if you are an advocate and you're out there all by yourself swinging in the wind, you don't have to because you can go into that group and say, hey, listen, I'm in Canada or hey, listen, I'm in Australia. Buddy up and work together. OK, so oops, I'm going to get you the um, Spanish version of the threats. Thanks, Jeff. But, you know, this is the thing we all three things we all need to communicate we all need to work together and we all need to strategize together however in each individual country you have to do the work in your country um the rest of us will support you absolutely okay but the the actual hard work and the hard yards have to be done in the country hold on let me share this in in espanol yeah i've, I've said i've said in in that whatsapp group you know if anyone's thinking about doing a campaign and want some help or not sure how to do it i'm just email me i'll help you out you know uh, um, i've spoken to some of the uk vaping press because i know uh, cop cop is a very complicated subject you know and knowing what fctc is a treaty what the yeah. fc secretary is the administration of the treaty what the bureau is it's the the ones who are going to write the documents for the for the meeting and the conference of the parties itself is a meeting of all the signatories and the decisions are made by the parties by the delegations they're not made by these people at the who and whatever mm -hmm. whatever the parties decide the who if the parties came out i mean it's not going to happen but if the parties came out and said we would like to recommend that all countries in the world uh, allow recreational vaping now that would really hurt the who but there's nothing they can do to stop it because that they're the people who are making the decisions, the parties, the national governments, the national delegations, and this is why we have to tell the de national delegations that what we want them to do at the COP at COP ten in, in Panama in November. Um, you know, there's a lot of people think that it's the WHO is is uh, well, it is. It's, it's advising the parties wrongly. It's it's guidance. evidence and guiding them in the wrong direction. But at the end of the day, the part the parties are from the national countries, and they have to go and do. What they're told to do by their government and if the government is getting lots of letters from people saying we want you to do this then it, it helps helps them helps to form what they're going to say when they get to that meeting you know it's um i'd even say if, even if you're in a country like australia or mexico or these really half countries still write to your still write to your representative and say what you want them to do you know they'll probably write back and say no we're not going to do that but at least mm -hmm. you've registered your voice you know and you and, and and it's it's the voices just just to go back to somewhere near the beginning you know everyone talks about the uk has been a really good example but in 2010 i mentioned the mhra wanted to ban vaping within 21 days and the only thing that stopped it was one over 1000 vapors sent responses to that and stopped it and uh, and then we had then in 2012 we had the e european union's tobacco products directive and it, the UK sent a whole load of people over. I went, I went over to Place de Luxembourg in Brussels and we were, we were blowing up black balloons and chanting things. And we had people from Germany and Belgium, all, all different countries. And, and that, people got to realise that that TPD originally wanted only to allow medical devices, rather like what Australia's got at the moment. They wanted a maximum nicotine limit of two milligrams. They wanted all that Australia is, is sort of talking about at the moment. And that was fought off because of consumers turning up and making their voice known. They managed to talk to a few MEPs. It got into the parliament and that got got fudged into what is the TPD now. And what is important about that TPD, which they're going to try and challenge because these pro prohibitions, they never give up. They, they never seem to sleep, um, is that they, they set a difference between cigarette products and safer safer nicotine products so that is enshrined in eu law and that's why the eu for example netherlands would love to ban vaping products but they can't they're doing the next best thing they're banning all flavors um all flavors including tobacco but they they can't ban it because they're still in under the tpd so 
you know, this is where consumers can get involved. The UK wouldn't be where it was now if it wasn't consumers in 2010 screaming and saying, we don't want you to ban vaping within 21 days. And that made the government think. And then David Cameron, who was the prime minister at the time, didn't act on that. He left it up to the European authorities. And then we sort of campaigned against the European authorities and headed that one off. And that's why the UK is where it is. It didn't happen in a vacuum. It didn't happen by people sitting there just putting things on Twitter and sitting on their hands. It happened because they actually did something. And that's how the UK got to where it is now. And now the government is backing vaping. So it shows you what can happen if you put your mind to it and, and get involved in the process. But if you don't get involved, don't be surprised if it all goes against you. That's what I'd say. You're muted. See, you see, um, Blinky, I'm right there with you. I'm an awkward. What you allow continues. Okay. I mean, that's just simple. That's just simply what it is. Um, Martin, thank you for taking this time on your evening to share with us. Um, everybody out there that's talking and, you know, like I said, if you want to join that global chat, you know what to do. It's in there. And we'll probably be doing this again. I think Martin, what do you think? <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I, I'm always glad to come on and talk, talk with you, Nancy. It's a, it's a joy, it really is. And sorry if I ranted. I no, it's okay. I, I thought I was going to rant today, and you're the one who actually ranted, so next one's my rant. Um, <laughs> everybody, <laughs> thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, most of you know how to get a hold of either one of us. Um, just, uh, yeah, do it. Ask the questions. Um, but mainly, you know, Let's get this done because we don't, we don't have much time. We really don't have much time. So once again, Martin, thank you, everybody. Thank you. I am going to let us go. So have a good night, morning, and afternoon, people. Bye, everyone.